Welcome, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today and thank you for your patience. My name is Suzanne Frazier and I'm a member of the lecture series committee. And on the committee's behalf, I welcome you to the 2021 AI Baltimore and Baltimore Architecture Foundation Spring Lecture Series. This series brings nationally and internationally recognized thought leaders to speak about design in relation to a timely theme and to draw connections to relevant issues here in Baltimore. The lecture series, it's celebrating its 43rd anniversary this year. And we are proud that this year also marks the sesquicentennial that is the 150th anniversary of AI Baltimore, the Baltimore chapter of the American Institute of Architects. The lunchtime lecture series are a long-standing tradition of the Baltimore Architecture Foundation and are an opportunity to focus exclusively on Baltimore specific topics that fit into the lecture series larger theme. And so on behalf of AI Baltimore and the Baltimore Architecture Foundation, thank you for joining us. This event would not be possible without a lot of support. Please take a moment to recognize our generous sponsors and please consider being a sponsor for next year's lecture series. This spring's first lunchtime lecture is entitled Money and Hose by Fan Hao. Fan Hao is a Baltimore-based multidisciplinary artist whose large-scale landscape painting, sculpture, installation, and performance art pieces have been exhibited across the United States at major venues and cultural institutions, including the Baltimore Museum of Art and the Smithsonian Arts and Industry Museum. Fawn received her BFA in painting from Boston University and her MFA from the Mount Royal School of Art at the Maryland College, Institute College of Art, where she, where she is currently an adjunct professor. Guided by philosophical, anthropological, and socio-political thinking, Fawn's work urges us to rethink how gardening and landscaping practices can mobilize the development of more environmentally thoughtful and sustainable futures. This is a terrific occasion to learn more about Fawn's body of work, including her current exhibition entitled, A Bag of Rocks for a Bag of Rice. Before I turn the screen over to Fawn, a bit of housekeeping. We will do a Q&A at the end of the lecture, so please use the Q&A box to submit your questions. The chat box is, is for general dialogue, not for questions. We will not be reading any questions from the chat box, only the Q&A box. So without any further ado, Fawn Hao. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and pray that there's no glitches. So give me one second. All right. Share, okay. Um, so thank you so much to AIA Baltimore and the uh, Baltimore Architecture Foundation for having me to be part of their 2021 Spring Lecture Series. It is super exciting and such a privilege to be here. And especially many thanks to Suzanne Frazier for the amazing introduction. Um, in addition, I also wanna acknowledge that this talk takes place on the ancestral lands of the Piscataway people, which is known today as Baltimore. I humbly offer my respects to the Piscataway community for the privilege of having this lecture due to the direct and indirect violence of settler communities. Um, but also I wanted, um, as an American born Taiwanese woman, um, wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the unprecedented attacks and violence against the AAPI community since the start of the pandemic, but also isn't something new and how it has always been a part of America's racist history. So um, we no longer can stand in silence and I hope that we can all be united to rise above racism. Okay, now to really get started. And again, hello, my name is Fawn Hong and um, I'm super excited to be here with all of you today and talk about my work. Um, I consider myself as a landscape painter, just like Bob Ross here, um, but through the use of, or like using the language and tradition of landscape painting, I use multidisciplinary approaches to explore the production of landscapes and discuss the various intersectional issues and power dynamics between humans 
and nature, the environment, and the Anthropocene epoch, all in hopes to mobilize the development of more environmentally thoughtful and sustainable futures. Um, what I'm going to do next is run through some major influences and moments in my life that will help provide context on how my ideas and concepts um, developed over time and led me to my latest exhibition that Suzanne talked about, which is a bag of rocks for a bag of rice um, at Towson University. Um, so I guess I want to say that my interest in exploring landscapes and our human relationships with nature started when I was like a baby painter in college back in 2004. Um, while reflecting back on this body of work that I created for my undergraduate thesis, I realized that I was always fascinated by man's motivation to manipulate nature, especially through the lens of maintaining one's yard. Um, and I think a lot of that had to do with my father and while growing up, seeing him always maintaining his yard, the way he like aesthetically sees fit and then performing that maintenance, like mowing the lawn, watering the plants, trimming hedges, planting plants of his choosing, spraying for weeds, et cetera, um, he, and doing this like on a daily basis and every weekend. Um, but he would also like to criticize neighbors and even his friends who did not perform that maintenance and um, or did not meet his aesthetic vision. Um, and also to create a yard that really works for him um, to like even poison a protected cypress tree um, because by law you can't cut it down. And so this is way, how he found his loophole was by poisoning it to death um, located in our backyard because the knees um, from the cypress tree were sticking out and made it inconvenient for him to mow the lawn. Um, so that's like a pretty good definition of manipulating nature on a personal level for the convenience of mowing. Um, but also just having spent most of my life growing up in South Florida in a very nicely manicured suburb called Coral Springs. Um, so here are um, some drawings, that, or a series of drawings that I created in college that um, lampooned gardening practices modeling it after Goya's Los Capriccios. Um, just, you know, like here's bugs eating plants. Um, and while doing research for this drawing series, I learned that if you keep your lawn at a certain length, it helps prevent weeds. So here's a man obsessively measuring his lawn height. Um, and then here is a painting of my brother's friend, Paul, who modeled for me pulling weeds in front of my house in South Florida. Um, and then, Another major influence on how I think about the landscape was taking this job at a company called Foxconn several years after college. Um, Foxconn is known as the third party manufacturer, infamously known for manufacturing all your iPhones since the beginning of iPhone time. And in addition to pretty much all the devices we currently use. Um, but so for instance, like the group I worked for focused on Motorola products, um, anyways. Um, but I really, 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 really hated working there. Um, but the experience did make me rethink different ways of visualizing landscape through the implications of manufacturing. So here in this case, like in this photo, the manipulation of the original landscape to create a manufacturing landscape full of buildings, dirt, and barely any plant life. Um, and then also receiving the hard lessons about extraction of raw materials from the earth in this case, the mining of precious metals and other elements to create our devices, um, learning about supply chain and supply chain logistics that went with this production, um, and especially the communities that have been exploited to do the extractive labor to gather those raw materials in the not best conditions. Um, and then ultimately, as an end result, um, besides the extremely large environmental footprint, um, seeing how all these extraction processes um, created um, just to create a cell phone has completely manipulated the landscape on a significant level. So for instance, wiping out what was there before completely and then creating a new one, just like the photo that we see here. Um, and again, all to create the devices that we love so, so much and will never forever, um, will always forever be dependent on. Um, but anyways, obviously cell phone production is just one example of extraction um, and changing of the physical landscape. Um, and the next thing I want to talk about, like while working at Foxconn um, and hating this job so much, the Mayan apocalypse was supposed to be well on its way. And with the potentiality of this prophecy coming true, 
it propelled me to think um, or really think hard or just really become a full-time artist. Because if the Maya apocalypse did happen, I did not want to my spirit to be trapped in a cubicle with like harsh fluorescent lighting and fake uncomfortable air on chairs. So I quit and I survived the Mayan apocalypse. I guess we all did. Um, and then started applying for grad school. Um, but during this time, like while, you know, making that transition, um, it propelled me to start thinking about landscapes less representationally. Um, and so also reflecting on my experiences at Foxconn and coping with the PTSD from working there, it really made me start an exploration into thinking about what nature would look like in a post-apocalypse devoid of humans, which I thought of as an optimistic post-apocalypse. Um, and then going forth creating landscapes or landscape paintings on paper with that idea in mind. Um, and then starting with more of like the idyllic picturesque, um, and then eventually um, starting to work larger and then work even larger. And, but now like creating harsher landscapes um, after being very influenced by the notion of the sublime by Edmund Burke and creating like literal interpretations of it. Um, but also working within this linear format then a traditional landscape format as if it were a fragment or glimpse into a scary future. And I wanted my like landscapes to represent harsh but beautiful environments that no person can survive in. And then going even larger, thinking about blockbuster movies that you would see in IMAX theaters and how seeing a movie in that scale created a more intense and immersive experience. And then um, I guess still being influenced by the movies um, as a form of escapism um, as well, it prompted me to really just stick with just making extremely large scale paintings as much as possible. And here, this is an image of my first attempt at creating an immersive installation, which did not really work out, um, but learned a lot from it that I did for my MFA thesis. Um, and I quickly wanna say that I've typically started using paper and even all my large scale paintings are mostly done on paper because I felt that paper represented the ephemerality of nature itself and how it could be easily ripped or torn apart. But also at the time um, when I made the hard switch from painting on canvas to paper, I felt like it created a smaller environmental footprint. So being able to just like flip the painting over if I don't like it and start new or easily tearing it apart to create something else or just to recycle. But even at that time, thinking about storage and transport, just being able to roll something up and not take up as much space, um, such as on like it would on a stretched canvas, the weight, et cetera. Um, but However, eventually this work started getting larger and larger and, and accumulating over the years. Now storage is an issue. Um, but, and I do admit that like lately I have been working on canvas for conservation purposes and because now extremely large, um, because that way I can really work extremely large and not have to glue rolls of paper together, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay, one more thing. Um, I also wanna introduce this essay titled Imperial Landscape by W.J.T. Mitchell, who is an art historian and editor of this book, Landscape and Power. And I discovered this book in grad school. And in this essay, he starts with his theses on landscape. And like his theses have always stuck with me and been my guide on how I approach my work and my art practice and look at landscapes critically. Um, in addition to thinking about the intersectional and interchangeability from of what landscape painting could be and represent. Um, so from landscape painting to gardening culture, personal relationships, plant relationships, built environments and um, all that good stuff. Um, I also, during this time, this is like 2016 now, started to think about how the earth would protect itself from future colonizers using modern day war tactics. Um, camouflage, especially stuck out to me because of its like relationship with the landscape and with nature. Um, and from there, I've also started thinking about the dichotomy of how man will either manipulate the landscape in war by decimating with bombs and chemical weapons or using the landscape to their advantage to camouflage themselves. And how also over time, plant life or reconstruction again, changes the landscape to camouflage the destruction and the slow violence on earth and those who inhabit the area. So thinking about all those concepts really propelled me into creating these like hyper colored pattern and immersive environments like 
the one that I have been showing you here titled Biological Controls. And because I'm a landscape painter, um, hand painting every square inch of the space. Okay, and then what most people like know me for is my exhibition, The Succession of Nature at the BMA. Um, so from the previous exhibition, now I had the privilege to do a larger iteration for the BMA's um, Imagining Home exhibition, um, Commons Collaboration. And the Commons Collaboration was part of a program at the museum that required an artist to collaborate with a nonprofit organization to create work revolving around the idea of home. And so like thinking about home, um, I wanted to move beyond the traditional domestic notions of home and think of what home is um, when all of Earth's natural resources have been depleted or destroyed due to climate change. And to link these concepts together, I created a typical house shaped shelter to act as like a semiotic for home. Um, and inside there was a cot, a bench and a radio. Um, that played imagined sounds of like static in a post-human earth. Um, and I wanted these elements to activate viewers to investigate the space like an archeological dig, as if they found the remnants of the last person on earth, um, as if you were in the post-apocalypse. So like being the ghost, or I wanted to be like the ghost of Christmas future to show you what would happen if we didn't treat our earth so nicely and depleted all our resources. Um, the nonprofit organization I collaborated was with Blue Water Baltimore, and their mission is focused on water quality in Baltimore and its plant trees. So um, for inspiration um, for the color palette, I chose to use um, like, you know, a like a color palette that you would see in toxic polluted water. Um, and then here is another view from the opposite side of the house structure. And um, on that table, it housed like free zines um, that I created in collaboration with Blue Water Baltimore to educate museum goers about um, Baltimore's historic waterways and people were allowed to take it and it turns into like this cool poster. Um, and although it's not shown in this photo, um, there are also two sketchbooks on the table um, for those who visit the space were encouraged to write and draw um, based on these prompts, how to survive Baltimore in the apocalypse and apology letters to the environment. There are a lot of interesting, interesting things in there. Um, and then again, here are some more details. Um, this corner actually had like another sound that I have a recording of, but not a video recording of, um, where like a kind of like a gurgling well sound to kind of think of like nature restructuring itself. Um, and like the previous installation I did for biological controls, um, all the elements, the walls, the floors, the objects were all hand painted to really still tie it into um, the tradition of landscaping or just painting in, um, in general. And so again, like all the panels in this exhibition were all painted on paper. The logs that you see here were all like paper mache. The floors had to be MDF, obviously, to you know be able to endure like one year's worth of people going to the museum. And then here's just like another view of people hanging out, and then you know just to kind of give you an idea of scale. And then I thought I would include this photo of what it looked like before, so you can kind of see, you know, the the changes. So after that, yeah, like I continued um, painting and creating more site-specific large-scale painting installations. Um, it's like more paintings and, um, and just kept on going. I it would just keep finding certain topics that, um, that I would be, that I would come across and be interested in and like kind of create a site-specific work for that. Um, so for instance, this is um, an installation slash performance that I did in um, for a an art fair in New York called Spring Break. Um, and I just felt like the art fair would be a perfect situation to, to do this. And ultimately what this um, installation was about called You're in Good Hands um, was like kind of my reaction to reading articles about how like the mega 1% bajillionaires um, from Silicon Valley have been buying up land to create luxury bunkers um, and how they were all becoming like doomsday preppers. And 
I was like, wow, really? Like, is there something we don't know? Or like, but also like to just really think of that idea again of like landscape and power or like money being able to just buy you land and just, you know, be able to survive and all that stuff. And um, since I'm like kind of like a fanatic of like religious cults and secret societies and stuff, um, I created this um, kind of entity called or performance entity called ENDO which stands for the Eternal Navigators of Doom Organization. Um, so this organization offers insurance and assurances to help people um, kind of navigate through the impending environmental apocalypse by offering safe passage to the post-apocalypse. And so for spring break, um, I thought I wanted that organization to sell real estate in the post-apocalypse. So you can kind of, you know, have that assurance or insurance to um, know that you'll you'll survive and I'll be there to help you survive. So here on the left, I'm like trying to like, I, I wanted to like also to really quickly say like, I wanted to set up like a classic um, real estate office look, but also have, um, you know, just like still have the paper patterning and all that stuff um, to again, to tie it to painting. Um, and then here on the right, you can see I've created MLS listings, just like you would see in a real estate office. And then just here are some people like interacting with the space. And in there, like I would just like do these sales pitches of being like, oh, like I'm selling real estate in the post-apocalypse and um, this is what we do. We have like three different types of land, um, not landscape, sorry, properties I can purchase. Um, one is frontier. So for if you enjoy like living out in the wilderness and the great outdoors, the other one was communal community, which is like more city living if you, that's like your type of lifestyle. And then another one was, um, I think, oasis, which, which is like more beachfront. Um, and again, so I had like 12 of these listings and this one specifically related to this condo that I purchased. Um, when I was young and dumb in 2009, I think, um, right after the housing boom um, or like when the bubble crashed. And again, like kind of wanting to relate these experiences of like the real estate market along with like how that um, relates to the like, you know, pretty much the 1% like purchasing luxury bunkers and stuff like all this like speculative real estate. And then just marketing materials that um, that I actually printed and people were able to take away. Um, and then even all the like the email addresses and um, websites work as well. Um, and then I did this thing for Facebook and, you know, just like kind of continue to create large scale site specific painted installations or thinking like for me thinking of like this like giant landscape painting within, within this space. But, you know, after creating these spaces and also like just wanting to change directions um, in work for the future, um, I wanted to also like step away from the optimistic, po uh, optimistic post-apocalypse and refocus back to you know, the idea of man manipulating nature and also feeling that it wasn't really truly fair to blame all of humanity for Earth's environmental destruction. And so I went and revisited landscape and power um, and investigate like how we got here. And so back to the fascination of why man seeks to control nature and the landscape through extraction, transplantation, colonization, imperialism, white supremacy and capitalism and um, how it created probably our superficial relationships with nature today. Um, and that also made me wanna start investigating into like more of like the micro histories of managed landscapes um, and plant life. So for instance, the yard, like, you know, thinking about my father and other built landscape environments um, because, and then questioning like what is so natural um, about these environments if they are so controlled and are taking, um, you know, plant life extracted from other um, non-Indigenous places and being placed there. Um, and also I wanted to question like the labor and energy involved to create and maintain these spaces from a supply chain point of view as well. So going back to thinking about my time at Foxconn, 
Um, and then hoping through all that we can destruct, uh, deconstruct all these built natural environments or landscapes to help us start and understand to construct new ways of how we can truly be eco-friendly and live symbiotically with plant and animal life and hopefully toward um, climate change. And that's how landscaping's equivalent about landscape and power is translated for me as money and hose. Um, the thinking about the capital required to create a built natural environment and the irrigation it requires depending on what you put in that garden. Um, so since I was invited to do an exhibition at the Asian Art and Culture Center at Towson University, um, and because I am of Chinese and Taiwanese descent, I thought it would be a perfect opportunity to start, you know, investigating those microhistories into gardening practices. And for this, like this site, um, specifically um, wanting to look at um, Chinese and Japanese Zen gardens. And I place them both together because I they are interculturally connected, you know, like the Japanese, like I wouldn't say like copy the Chinese, but it like took like, you know, what they learned from the Chinese back to Japan and created their own style and version. Um, and out of convenience, I thought um, it would be best to show you this pre-recorded video lecture I made for the virtual opening of the exhibition um, since the actual opening had to be canceled due to COVID. Um, and this works out great because I can take a break from talking. So hopefully this will play and you all can hear me. And let me know if you can't. Hi, my name is Paula Tong, and I would like to thank you for coming to my virtual opening for a bag of rocks for a bag of rice here at Towson University Asian Arts and Cultural Center. Let's go look at the show. So as you enter the gallery, you see the name and title of the show. And over here is the porcelain vessel for the Asian Art Gallery's collection. I'm really excited to be able to use this piece because you'll see how it ties into everything. And so as you enter into the gallery, you step directly into a physical painted landscape of a mountain range. And you can walk through this space as if you were immersed in that landscape. can observe all the painted details and features of the mountains. You can walk behind the mountains. You can peek through it. And you just keep going and as you exit the mountain range, here you will see a small rock garden. And then also on the wall, a painting that resembles a traditional Chinese landscape painting. I apologize if it's As a little glitchy. Looking at the painting, you turn around and look back out into the landscape. Go back out into the mountains and look at the garden and the painting from there. And go around again if you prefer. And then let's go back around again through the mountainscape. So now we can observe what it looks like on the back side of the paintings. And as you can see, it's painted in the blue and white porcelain color palette as the rock garden. So here we are back at the beginning of the show and the dubbing is gonna get really horrible and serious now. So please bear. Okay, I think since it's too glitchy because this might be overpowering my PowerPoint since I embedded it in there, I'm going to stop the video um, and then just show.
show a series of images and try to remember everything that I said in my um, in my opening. And if it can only stop, if it can only move, that would be pretty wonderful. Um, give me one second and I apologize for the technical difficulties. Um, but anyway, so that was the, the little tour. If one day, if y'all can, I don't know when Towson will be able to open up again, be able to go see. But um, ultimately, I guess what I was thinking with, you know, thinking about wanting, I mean, I guess I'll start with this. Like I wanted to really kind of go down the line and dissect different um, types of like, you know, human produced landscapes. And um, so for instance, like a botanical garden, a greenhouse, um, a, a median, and like what that means. And I think my computer is going to crash. So I hope you can still hear me. Um, and there, like, it's like a Chinese garden. Like I always like kind of found it um, really absurd or not absurd, but just like really interesting on how, you know, they really wanted to replicate a natural space and like, for themselves um, to, you know, like for them to have on their own. All right, the presentation crashed her computer. So she's logging back in um, from her other computer from her laptop and we will uh, proceed with the Q&A section as soon as she rejoins us. And you're back. Hi, Fawn. Oh my God. Ah, like I can't, I never thought I would have like. It's the, it's the apocalyptic Armageddon. I guess so. It's <laughs> happening on, on my watch. Um, so I apologize. And I, I'm like, I don't know if you were able to go see through the whole show, but um, what I can do really quickly um, is show the images, the still images well, it's, um, it's okay, Fawn, we have a lot of, we have a lot of questions actually okay. for you, if you, cool. if you're feeling up to it after. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready for anything now. <laughs> All right. There's a lot of curiosity about your work and your processes. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to parse these down into sort of um, bite-sized questions. Um, so one of the first ones um, was that, um, uh, you've been thinking um, for nearly two decades about um, apocalypse and Armageddon and um, and survival and um, an anticipation of urgency. So in this past year, did you um, did you were you thinking I've been telling you all along or or were you? Are you, were you feeling that we were heading towards something for the past two decades? And I'm speaking, uh, the question is specifically about the reckoning and also the pandemic. Um, I guess in a way it's like, yes, there was a moment of like, I told you so, like, you know, I've been trying to tell you, but then feeling pretty defeated that like, I can only do so much through storytelling, like through the art of storytelling by just creating art because it's only, like a limited audience can can see and experience that or they would have to go to the museum to experience it um, or a um, another gallery space. But I guess when the pandemic hit, it was it was like, wow, we are now in about a post apocalypse feels so rude, you know, and um, unacceptable. And so I felt like I, you know, like even though like wanting to have like an imagine future is still relatable, but I don't know. I just felt like I, I needed to, not when I say needed to stop, but just, I don't know, like it, it just didn't feel right. And, um, and it, I guess, worked out in a way for this exhibition since I was trying to already get away from the whole apocalyptic sin scenarios. Um, and well, that's, a, that's yeah. a great segue into, into another question. Um, uh, specifically regarding your BMA installation, which uh, it seems that a lot of the people online had the opportunity to see. So now they get to see, put your face with that, with that piece of art. Um, uh, uh, most, ex 
uh, let's see. So the question is, um, there was a lot of joy in that room when uh, the person got to visit it. How do you react to, to the joy that that um, piece of art evoked? Um, oh my God, now my other computer is coming online. Give me one second. Uh, disconnect. It's not, it's okay. It's just a W. Okay. Um, I, I did it. I got rid of it. Um, I, I guess like, I, I am not upset. Like I, I am happy and open to everyone's interpretations. And if they enjoy the space, like that's totally okay. I didn't want to be that person that's just there kind of like, you know, berating people and, and like, you know, lecturing, cause that's just never works, um, for anybody. And, um, but I guess just as long as people were able to experience, have fun with the space and still learn from it, um, I, you know, it doesn't matter. Like, I don't need everyone to come out depressed and sad. <laughs> I don't think that would be very healthy. Um, but, you know, just even if it, if they were happy and it evokes like, um, you know, like a happy space for them, that's, that's totally fine. And that space was used for like a lot of things like performances and, um, and lectures and stuff like that. So it was very multifunctional and I'd rather have it be that than, you know, just why, why be depressed? Like we're already all so depressed, I feel like. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of curiosity in our audience about, um, about how you make your pieces. So there is one question, have you um, ever considered making your own paper to make your own artwork pieces? Mm, I mean, ideally, yes, that would be lovely, but that is extremely labor intensive <laughs> to like make my own paper and source all that and, you know, um, have the space to like smash everything together and the, it, it just, no way, I can't do it. I'm sorry. <laughs> There's like a limit to what I can humanly do. So I guess that that means you don't mix your own paint either. There was a question about your paint and the palette and environmental toxicity in your own processes. Yeah, I don't like to do that either. I mean, I, mean, I do, I still mix paint and all that good stuff, but um, you know, like why, you know, to like why I choose these colors is because they are like kind of man-made. So like fluorescent colors, for instance, like you're not gonna, I mean, very, very, very rarely find that in nature somehow, you know? And so like in a way like, that human touch represents something that could be like the residual effect over time, like I guess in the in the post apocalypse and stuff like that. And but also like these bright colors um, also symbolize, you know, um, awareness or like if you're at a construction site and you need to wear your um, your blaze orange to protect yourself from getting injured or if you're hunting, um, all that good stuff. And just so I don't know, I just like have I, I, I keep having like these like weird I don't want to say weird, just really going maybe super deep with like, like what represents or this represents and, and all that stuff and, and everything that I do. You keep, that's fantastic. That's another segue for an audience, <laughs> next audience question. Um, ha, have you considered working with natural plants um, and incorporating them into your pieces? And they specifically were saying like air plants or living wall systems. Like I, I feel like I don't want to do that because it kind of goes against what I'm trying to talk about, like with like kind of constructed spaces. So like, I'm not going to go source a bunch of air plants that come from, you know, like someone has to go get that, you know, and then, then like someone's going to have to maintain that. And I, you know, ideally like in a perfect world, like, yes, that would be beautiful. Like we have like this natural air, we have like this, you know, actual natural, um, but it still requires like a certain amount of energy it required, like someone to grow that plant, someone to, um, you know, put it together to maintain it, um, finding a space for it, making sure, making sure you can keep it alive. Um, but so like with that thinking, like, you know, why do we do that? But also like, can we find more, like, I guess, native plant species as, you know, to do that. And I have been thinking about, you know, like, how I can do that outside instead of trying to take it inside, like trying to, if having the opportunity one day to 
do like, I guess we'll call it like an earthwork, um, but using native plants and, um, you know, and not kind of, I guess, terraforming or like transforming like the, the original landscape in general, but keeping it true to, um, true to its like originality or like indigenous self, like um, that is something that I have thought about, but I don't want to, again, like to be like that person making like this fantastical greenhouse because that just goes against like everything I talk about in, in Bag of Rocks. Well, that's interesting because there is a question here. Would you consider collaborating with a landscape architect? I think someone in yes. the audience would like to of work course. with you. Yes, that would be <laughs> awesome. That would be so perfect. And yes, yes, yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> good, good. Um, let's see. Um, there's a very specific question. Did you, let's see, for your on-site installations, did you pre-plan your shapes, color, design, um, on the built elements or did you de did you design on site as you painted? I pre-designed. So, well, the like I would have like a sketch, I would do a SketchUp model or I would make my husband make a SketchUp model for me um, since he knows how to use that and like kind of lay out exactly like how many panels, painting panels I'll need. Um, and then just, but also like, cause I had to present um, the actual proposal um, to the museum. But for, um, I guess like for biological controls, like the first one that I did, that was just like, yeah, measuring the space, making sure everything fits. And luckily like small, being small enough where if I had to go run back to my studio, I can just like quickly like, you know, patch things up and stuff like that. Um, but um, with the Smithsonian and other places, um, yes, like still trying to pre-plan versus, you know, like you just, everything will go wrong. Like I feel <laughs> just like construction of anything in general being on site is just, and, and like this like webinar even is just like technical difficulties will happen. Speaking of technical difficulties. Oh, no. <laughs> oh dear. Did I jinx it like by saying that? Maybe. Um, okay, we've, we read the one about on site installations. I think we have actually worked our way through all of the questions. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so is there anything else we'll uh, go through and I can announce um, the upcoming lectures? So in two weeks, um, let me screen share real quick. In two weeks, we have our next evening lecture on March 31st. And um, the last of the evening lectures is on April 21st. And our next lunch lecture is on April 7th. Um, with NDC. And if anyone wants to learn more about where they can find your information, where should we send them? Oh, um, you can go to my website, um, which is fawn.com. And I can, can I throw stuff in the chat? Like, okay. Um, to the chat. Yay. And then um, also you can um, follow me on Instagram, which is probably like the easiest place to know what I'm doing um, at Fawn Love and see what's up and message me and all that good stuff. Ooh, we did have one more question come in. Um, okay. Besides the essay you mentioned, do you have any other recommended reading uh, related to this exhibit or your work? Well, actually I, I do have like an essay that I created or wrote about the exhibition and it's on the Towson website. It's just kind of hard to, if you can give me one second to find that link for you. Um, oh, actually, you know what? If you go to my website, I do have like a cop, a, a PDF of the the press release slash um, essay that I wrote for the exhibition, and that'll kind of give you all the brief overview of what I'm thinking. Um, and also, I think a copy of the lecture for that talk is on their website. So I can, I guess, like today, I can like throw those links onto my website. Um, and then you guys can check it out and not have to probably deal with all these fun glitches and stuff like that. That's not a problem. It happens. 
All right. And with that, I think we are all good. Um, thank you, Fawn, for joining us. This, this awesome. Afternoon. Thank you so much for having me and thank you all and have a great, great week and great day. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you.